Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Jim Duffy, and I'm responsible for the marketing and sales of all the services here at Code. Yes, Code is much more than just a magazine. The world of Code includes Code Magazine, of course, but also Code Consulting, Code Training and Mentoring, and finally, Code Staffing. Our webinar audience today includes Code Magazine subscribers, Code Consulting software development clients, as well as people completely new to the Code family. Whether this is your first time attending one of our webinars or your fifth, thanks for joining us. In addition to Marcus answering questions, we have expert members of our Code Consulting team in the chat room, so jump in and ask your questions in the chat window. If you don't currently subscribe to Code Magazine, you will soon. As a benefit for attending, Based on the email address you registered with, all registered attendees will automatically receive a free Digital Code Magazine subscription, provided you don't already subscribe. I've also included a free subscription link to share with your coder friends, associates, colleagues, team lead, CTO, social media followers, enemies, your arch nemesis, and so on. If they code, they should be reading Code Magazine. It's time to get things rolling. Our presenter today is Marcus Egger. Those of you who have attended our previous webinars or have seen him speak at conferences or have attended any of our training classes over the years, you're familiar with Marcus. For everyone else, Marcus is the big cheese around here. He's the code president and chief software architect, publisher of Code Magazine, international author and speaker, Microsoft regional director, and all around nice guy. He'll be ready to start in just a moment. We here at Code pride ourselves on helping people build better software. We build custom solutions from the ground up for some clients, modernize legacy applications for others, and support, maintain, and enhance existing applications for others. Whether it's a cloud-based or solution, a web application, a mobile app, or a Windows desktop application, we can help with whatever platform you're targeting. Our team of expert developers and consultants are ready to help you with your project. Got questions? Maybe you're unsure about what technology or platform to use for your next project. Perhaps you're looking for guidance about what client-side JavaScript framework to use. Or maybe you have questions about developing for the cloud. Perhaps you have questions about database architecture. We would be happy to spend an hour or so on the phone with members of your organization, answering your team's questions, and providing guidance. No charge. No strings. No commitment. No credit card. Just free help from our code experts. Reach out to me about getting your free hour of code scheduled. My email is on this slide. Of course, we would love for you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook if you like what you see today or have seen in the prior webinars. Talent is something we're always on the lookout for, whether it's adding talent to our software development teams or finding authors to write for the magazine. Check out these links if you're interested. Our code staffing division can help provide developers to augment your development team if necessary. Finally, we would like your feedback about this webinar. And there could be a $100 Amazon e-card in it for you if we randomly draw your name as the lucky attendee. The survey is very short, and you'll finish it in no time flat. Make sure you get yours filled out by this Friday night, November 20th, to be eligible. It's almost time to turn things over to Marcus, but before I do, I want to share with you that the slides and the recording of today's webinar, and all of our prior webinars, will be available on the stateof.net page on the code website. I've included that link on this slide. Okay, that's it for me, and I know Marcus is ready to go, so go ahead and take it away, Marcus. Thank you very much, Jim. Hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, awesome to see a great turnout again. Uh, awesome to see how many uh, people watched our prior .NET 5 recording online, even after the fact. So I know this is a topic where a lot of people have huge interest in what's going on. Uh, and we got a ton of more stuff to talk about here today uh, and probably for upcoming events as well. So looking into that, um, I just switch to the next slide here if I can get my mouse to work. So here is what we are going to talk about today. At first, I'm going to do a .NET 5 overview and a little bit of a recap. Now, some of the people that were in last month's presentation they may know some of this already, but I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. But I want to make sure we're not losing anyone from the get go. So if you already know that stuff, then um, bear with me for just five minutes in, in the first part of this presentation. We will then 
proceed to talk about some of the things that we just briefly touched on in last month's event and go into a lot more detail with that. So you'll actually see a lot more code in today's presentation. Uh, in particular, we'll be looking at desktop development with .NET 5. That's kind of an area that uh, most of the time people don't touch on so much, but it's actually, I think, super important because it shows how to go forward and uh, preserve a lot of the assets that a lot of people have. And there's some, some really interesting things going on in there. Now, of course, web development of all kinds is always uh, uh, among the most important of the .NET talk, uh, topics that, that we talk about. So Blazor is super important. We did a long uh, presentation about that in the past. I encourage you to go back to that and watch it. I'm not going to redo all of that today because we just don't have enough time. Uh, but I will go into some of the new things that are in Blazor that are really, really interesting. And then, of course, whether you do desktop development, web development, IoT development, you will probably always need some kind of API or service layer to actually get to your data to perform business logic and so on. And there's some really interesting new stuff in .NET 5 as well that we'll take a closer look at at today's presentation. Um, Starting with an overview, let's talk about what .NET 5 is for a moment. And I think it's really important to understand the .NET vision. Uh, in .NET 5, the big vision is one .NET. In fact, that used to be the term that a lot of people referred to .NET 5 before we knew that .NET 5 was going to be its name. And what does that mean? Well, one .NET means that we are getting away uh, from the segmentation of the .NET market with different runtimes, different frameworks, uh, different SDK surfaces, and we're getting back to one big .NET that everything runs on. Now, this is a long journey. The huge step is taken with .NET 5. In .NET 5, Microsoft created a single runtime that draws from the best runtimes that were around because we had several different .NET runtimes at this point. We had the classic .NET runtime. We had the mono-based runtime that especially the Xamarin guys were working on. Uh, we had things like the Silverlight runtime in the past. We have a runtime on Linux, on Mac, uh, for mobile devices, ARM, IoT devices, all those things play into that. And now all of that's brought together into one big runtime. And, and that's really interesting because it's not just that, oh, we've brought the Windows-based runtime or the server-based runtime forward, but there's many other areas that are really interesting, like the ARM-based devices, the IoT devices do a lot for optimization. The Mono guys used to do a lot for optimization. And those things came back into the core .NET 5 runtime and environment. And then everything that we now do builds on top of that. Now, did Microsoft get everything into .NET 5 that falls under that category? No, like always there's some things that'll happen a little bit later. Like the mobile development story around Xamarin is very good at this point, but it's not totally integrated into the .NET 5 vision yet. And that'll happen uh, in the .NET 6 timeframe. And I'll show you uh, the roadmap that uh, Microsoft has planned at this point. Uh, but in, in, in the big picture, there was a lot of heavy lifting that was done. And that's now in .NET 5. And we're all breathing a sigh of relief, I guess, that this is now complete. And the platform is now really where it should be and where everybody wanted it to be when Microsoft first started this .NET Core vision and, and moving things into .NET Core. So it's exciting and it's especially exciting if you think about all the different things that are going on and that were needed uh, to go into that. If you want to look at the journey to 1.NET, let's do a very, very brief detour into the history lesson. This is a slightly different way of looking at it. It's really amazing when you think back and you think back to say early 2000s or even 1999 and you realize a lot of the stuff that we did back then still works unchanged today. That's basically unheard of, that kind of longevity uh, and being able to reuse assets that we had from back then. There were many twists and turns, uh, things like Silverlight and Windows Phone that went away, but there were also a lot of things that came out of that and that are still around. And the idea of .NET, of course, is to bring all of that forward and to unify that into .NET 5 
and create something that runs pretty much everywhere. Um, so that's, that's a, a really important piece of the story when you compare that to other platforms. Imagine how you do client-side web development and how that seems to break with every new package restore you do uh, to, to exaggerate a little bit, but you get the idea, right? It, it's not the longevity is not really there. While in .NET, you can go back, you can take a .NET 1 component and essentially run it on .NET 5 unchanged or uh, depending on the details almost unchanged so that's huge and that's how it'll continue into the future now one of the big things about dotnet 5 is that there's a lot of new stuff that that's cool there's a lot of new development that can happen on top of that platform but you don't have a huge amount of pressure to just abandon what you used to do so if you have an old WinForms app, uh, if you have a, a WebForms application, if you have a, an ASP.NET MVC app or, or anything like that, you should be able to move it forward without being in a dead end and without having a huge amount of investment and ideally gradually. But if it runs fine, it runs fine and you, you probably don't have to abandon it. So, so this kind of protection of your investment, I think, is, is one of the key points about .NET and and just huge here is kind of a few uh, a, a diagram that microsoft provided me that kind of shows that whole idea um, we have at core the dotnet runtime the dotnet 5 runtime which uh, is also dotnet standard so dotnet standard is what we used to call it in the past going forward that's still there but we probably don't have to call it .NET standard anymore because it's just .NET 5 is .NET standard. Um, and then we have some underpinnings like the compilers that compile into that and so on. But that's one solid foundation and that is now finally really true. And then on top of that sit all these other things like the Windows development, the web development, the things that you automatically think about, the, the cloud development, of course, needless to say that Azure is one of the driving forces behind all of this. I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about Azure here today because we had specific Azure presentations as part of the state of .NET before, but that's certainly very, very important and I encourage you to go back and watch those uh, earlier recordings that we did early in the year specific to Azure. So that's on sitting on top of that. Azure at this point supports .NET 5 and you can use all of that. Then there's the mobile development. That's a little less obvious. Now Xamarin is there. Xamarin is very popular and Xamarin now runs on top of the .NET 5 runtime and it's becoming unified. And that means you're building applications that run on Android, on iOS, but also on the Mac and a few other things. And in the future, and now we're talking more .NET 6 timeframe, in the future, the Xamarin stuff will get even more important. Now, how important we will see, uh, but the Xamarin guys are working on this really, really interesting initiative codenamed MAUI, which stands for Microsoft Application User Interface. Uh, and of course, it's also a cool island in the Pacific, which happens to be the island I live on. So I absolutely love this code name, but I don't know how popular that's going to be in the future. But it certainly is a huge effort and it promises to unify desktop development with mobile development. So the idea behind Maui is that you can combine and, and create a single code base, a single app, and that single app will then have uh, an iOS version, uh, an Android version, a Mac version, a Windows version. And that's kind of the big new thing with Maui, right? It's also Windows and it's, it's better Windows than it was in the past because Xamarin could kind of do Windows but nobody did it like that and it kind of wasn't a real uh, popular or prominent thing. So that's something that's gonna change there. And uh, uh, it's an, an ongoing story with Maui, but that's uh, .NET 6 timeframe, but already in the .NET 5 timeframe, there's a lot of new stuff in Xamarin. And that's probably a whole state of .NET talk in its own, but um, I encourage you to check this out. I don't have a huge amount of time to talk about that today. Uh, another thing, and, and now we're getting even further from what I can talk about today, but it's still important to know, is you can do gaming uh, on top of, of this platform or creating games, I should say. Now you may say, well, I'm, I'm a, a business application developer, probably fewer in this talk. Why would gaming be that important to me? 
Well, maybe gaming in itself is not that important, but a lot of these technologies that go into that, whether it's 3D visualization, whether it's even augmented reality or anything like that, uh, those things are also useful for business applications. And we have created applications where we use 3D visualizations on top of Unity uh, for the oil and gas business, for instance, is one of the things that we did. And then, of course, IoT, ARM devices, uh, things like Raspberry Pi, uh, little IoT cameras, all that type of stuff. Again, we want to be able to develop for with .NET and we were able to do that before, but now it's one platform. It's, it's all the same runtime. And that also goes for the AI stuff. So those are things, again, I don't have a lot of time or, or no time to talk about IoT and AI today. Uh, we talked a little bit about AI in a past state of .NET. We'll probably talk about IoT at some point in the future. Give us feedback if that's of interest to you, by the way. But long story short, all those things are now on one platform and they're driven by all the same tools, by all the same skills you have, whether that's Visual Studio, with, with uh, Visual Studio Code, some third party uh, environment that you like to use for development. Um, all those things just all come together in one beautiful story. Now, if you have any questions, by the way, feel free to ask him online. Uh, when I look over here, it's not that I'm losing interest in talking to you, but I'm looking at what my people feed me for questions. Um, I, I will try to answer some of the questions as they come in. I'll try to not get too wild. I noticed in last uh, month's uh, .NET 5 talk, there's a lot of questions. So I'll try to keep them a little bit towards the end, but I will get to all those questions, uh, I promise. Um, so... Talking in more technical terms, what is the .NET 5 platform? Uh, like I said, it uh, represents a shared code base, a unification of all these different .NET runtimes that we had in the past, taking the best of all of them and putting them together on top of this uh, .NET standard, standard uh, that we had before. And instead of now saying we are building for .NET standard, which is when you looked at the project structure in the past, when you built say a class library or a, uh, some kind of component. If you looked in the project structure, the compiler targeted net standard. That was uh, the actual target string that was in there. Nowadays, we're just targeting net five. Now, a lot of people always say, well, what, why I, I created all this .NET standard stuff and now you're telling me to change and abandon that again. That's actually not the case. Net five is really just the next version of net standard. And we don't have to differentiate anymore between building a net standard uh, DLL or building say an ASP.NET Core application. They are both net standard, uh, which now uses net 5.0 as the target framework identifier. Okay? Now there still are some features that are a little more specific. So for instance, when I build a Windows application, I may want to access things that are only available in Windows and it just wouldn't make sense anywhere else, like trying to access the registry. Well, that would make no sense on an IoT device that doesn't have that. So you really only have two options. One is you create the lowest common denominator and just limit access to that, which is essentially what happened in .NET Standard in the past. And that got to a point that worked very well, but it was still restrictive. Um, so the alternative is to say, well, we allow for special scenarios for supersets. And that is what we're doing with things like .NET 5 uh, dash Windows. That means you then have access to SDKs that are only available in Windows. And, and there'll be more different ones in the future. So for instance, in .NET 6, there will be a .NET 6 iOS and a .NET 6 Android. That's not currently in there. The Samarin guys are in charge of that. Um, but this will be coming and I'll show you the timeline here. I think it's my, my next slide. So, uh, looking at the question real quick. Uh, Daryl has a question. I don't know. Can you, uh, provide a little more detail on that? I'm not sure what the question is there exactly. And then I'll get back to that. So anyway, let's take a look at the roadmap. Right now we are here where the red arrow is. November 2020, .NET 5.0 has been released. It was released about a week ago at .NET Conf. November 10th is the official release date. That's when the true release drop of .NET 5 came out. Okay. 
Uh, now the story really kind of started a year ago with .NET 3.1 or .NET Core 3.1, I should say. And ever since then, we have been on this annual release cycle. So this is now the second year in this annual release cycle. And this annual release cycle will continue. So next November we'll have 6.0, the following November we'll have 7.0 and so on and so forth. And we'll always switch between one long-term support version and one that's kind of the in-between. In terms of support, we're kind of on the in-between. A lot of people will say, well, what does that mean? Does that mean I shouldn't use this version? No, that, that's not what it means at all. It just means that the 6.0 version will be very compatible with what we have in 5 and eventually it'll all get rolled into that. And then Microsoft commits to very long-term support for this stuff. Now, in-between, we'll have minor releases like we've always had. But this is the idea that this will be very, very predictable going forward with these releases. Okay. Now, a quick word about .NET Conf. Like I said, this happened last week. .NET Conf 2020 was a virtual conference. Uh, it's at .NET Conf .net is the URL that you see here. And by the way, all these things that we have in our slide deck here, all these URLs and whatever else, you can get this light deck after the fact. So you can download it just from our uh, events page. Anyone can get this and then you have all the URLs. So, so this was interesting. We were a sponsor. We also had some presentations. Uh, I did an interview, that sort of stuff. Um, and you can now go to this site. And in fact, I have this open somewhere. Uh, this is the .NET Conf site. If you go there today, and it has this sessions on demand link. So you can actually go into that and you can watch all the .NET Conf sessions from the keynotes to the even the community sessions. This was pretty much a, a 24 hour, three day long event uh, that just kept going on throughout the world. And there was community speakers that uh, had presentations at really odd hours of the day. And all of these things are now here. Uh, so you can watch that, you can download it, you can obviously get a lot more info here than I can relay to you within my hour or so that I have time here today. So that is .NET Conf, I encourage you to check this out. Another thing I want to draw your attention to, we announced that at last month's state of .NET and I couldn't really talk too much about the details because this was kind of embargoed still, but we were working on this code focus issue together with Microsoft. Uh, and this has since been released. What this is, it's an actual print mag uh, magazine, but you can also get the same information online here. If you just go to codemag.com slash focus, then this is just a free URL and it takes you to this issue. And in here, you'll see that we have a, a fairly large number of articles that cover all the most important uh, .NET 5 topic. So in a way, you can almost think of this as a small book that you can read cover to cover, telling you everything you need to know about .NET 5. And it's completely free of charge. You can do that here uh, on the website. You can also do it through our cool mobile app. It's probably hard to see here. But anyway, uh, if you have a mobile device, you can get access to it like that. And of course, it's an actual print publication. So if you're a subscriber, uh, you got this in the mail, hopefully already, or we'll uh, get it shortly. If you're not yet a subscriber, well, if you're in this presentation, uh, you're getting you're eligible for a free one anyway. Uh, but also pass this on to your friends and coworkers. This link at the bottom here is a free link. Uh, so I'm not trying to sell you anything. This is just free of charge. And you can sign up for this uh, issue and you'll, you'll just get a printed version of this issue if, if you would rather have the printed one. But anyway, lots and lots of detail. And if you actually attended .NET Conf and you attended my presentation last week, uh, last month, you'll notice that it kind of flowed through the topics that Microsoft presented. And that's no uh, coincidence. It's because we worked on a lot of this stuff uh, together. Okay. Uh, just a quick glance at uh, some of the questions. Somebody says, is .NET 5 cross-platform? Will it replace .NET Core? Yes, absolutely. .NET 5 is just .NET Core 5. It's the next version of .NET Core. It's just that we also brought in so many other things that we are not referring to it as .NET Core anymore. It's just now it's just .NET. This is, this is the new .NET that has everything, including .NET Core. Um, what are the major incompatibilities of this platform? Well, there's lots of little stuff. 
Uh, well, actually, maybe I'll take that back. It's, it's not a lot anymore. And you'll see some of that today. A lot of the holes that were there in the past got plugged. And so now it's more kind of like the things that got outdated and did that we don't really want anymore. A little oddities in the SDK that in hindsight we would have rather done differently and, and this was the chance to fix it. But there's really not that many things that are abandoned. Uh, the big thing is web forms, right? So if you are doing .NET 1.0 web form style development ASPX files uh, and you've done that since 2000 in Visual Studio, whatever the version was back in the day, that's not moving to .NET 5, .NET Core, whatever, and, and it never will. It's just not the way to go anymore. But other than that, many, many things have been moved over and are now there. So I see there's lots more questions. I'll move on, but I'll get to the questions uh, to, uh, a little bit later towards the end of the talk. So anyway, what do you need to do .NET 5 development? Uh, well, you need the .NET 5 SDK. One good way to get that is by getting Visual Studio 2019. Uh, I recommend you get the preview version. Uh, that's 16.9 something. Uh, but technically speaking, you can get the release version at 16.8, 16.8.1. Uh, those were the first versions that technically were released versions for .NET 5 that included all the .NET 5 bits and pieces. So that's what you need. Um, uh, to do .NET 5 development. Now you could also use, uh, of course, Visual Studio Code. You can use Visual Studio for the Mac. You can uh, even use uh, third-party IDEs as I sometimes do. And they all support this uh, uh, new version as well. So that was one of the questions online that I asked, um, that, that I answered, that was asked. So anyway, moving along here. <clears throat> so let's dive into this. And let's take a look at some specific development. And now we've seen a lot of slides. I think it's time we move on and uh, get into some coding stuff. So let's first talk about Windows development. There's many different things to talk about when we talk about .NET 5. I could have started with web development. I could have filled a day with web development. And I didn't want to do that because everybody always does that. And there's obviously a lot to web development. And I'll get to some of that a little bit later. There's things like Blazor, there's web API stuff. Um, but again, we've done separate stata.nets on that. They're all available free of charge. Go and take a look at that. So today I decided let's start with Windows development because there's actually some really interesting stuff going on. Uh, and the one item that's at the top of my list is that WPF and WinForms development is now supported as a first class citizen in .NET 5. Now that was already there in a way in .NET Core 3.1, but that was the first step into that. So it was supported, but you could see it was kind of a version one. And it was great that that was there, but the designer support was lacking and some features were lacking, like click once deployment that a lot of people uh, were relying upon. Now we have a much more complete version and a version that's actually even improving on some of those technologies. Uh, so we have improved designer support both in WinForms as well as SAML. Uh, so some of those designers didn't work at all in .NET Core 3.1. Now they all work and they, they've actually been improved. So let's just actually go into Visual Studio. So I have uh, Visual Studio 2019 preview here. And we can just go ahead and we create a new project here. And I'm going to search for WinForms templates. And I'm going to look, of course, for C-sharp. And you see that when I look for WinForms templates, I see WinForms app for .NET Framework, and I see WinForms app for .NET. When it says just .NET, then that means it's .NET 5. We are not differentiating anymore between full framework, .NET Core, .NET Standard. It's just .NET. Right? So we'll go ahead and uh, I'm just going to put that into my test folder and I'm just going to do a very quick thing here just so you see what's going on. There's a question online. What's the difference between .NET Core 3 and .NET Standard 3.0? Actually, there wasn't a .NET Standard 3.0. There was a .NET Standard 2 and 2.1 uh, and that was just a standard specification as to what .NET 
supports across the board, kind of what's a, what's a common denominator that every version of .NET should support. And when you chose that as a target to build your project, then it would make sure you're not using things that are not generally supported. Now we're just moving beyond that and we're on .NET 5 and whatever works in .NET 5 generally works everywhere. And if not, then uh, the IDE and the designers help you with that. So here is our project, uh, C Sharp Windows Forms project. I could now go ahead and, and build my app and do things like drop buttons on here and, and uh, check boxes and whatever else. I'm not going to go into anything specific here. Um, but what's different about this and what's important about this is, first of all, the way the project structure works. Um, so the, the first thing I can do is I can go into properties and I can look at what we are compiling for here. Now, this template works all the way back to .NET Core 3.1 and the current default is .NET Core 3.1. Now, I'm just going to switch this to .NET 5 because we've become modern developers and we want to do that. Now, what actually happens when I do that? Uh, it's going to reload my project here. And it now is a .NET 5 project. And I can actually double click my project file here. And I can actually look at what it takes to build this project. And so what it says here is we are creating an output type that's a Windows EXE. So it creates a Windows loader. Now, this type of project will never run on an iPhone. It just doesn't make sense. We are specifically setting out to build a Windows application. So what we're doing is we're using .NET 5 with Windows specific extensions. That's what this tells us. And that's all we need to do to create a .NET 5 Windows app that runs on this new platform. Um, and otherwise it's just .NET 5, right? So I could now hit F5 and run this and you can imagine what that looks like. It's a Windows Forms app that starts up. But that's the, the main difference is uh, that we now have this. Now, a lot of people say, well, what does this buy me? Uh, this is really just going to run my WinForms application like it always did. And to some extent, that's true. Now, you're going to benefit from some improvements. You're going to ben benefit from some fixes. You're going to benefit from some modernizations that were made. But those were admittedly relatively minor. But what this does for you first and foremost is it gets you out of a dead end. It means that WinForms is supported going forward in a platform that makes sense if you need to build Windows apps. Um, and, and you're not abandoning your investment, right? So that's pretty significant. Now you can also now use in your WinForms app, you can use new APIs and SDKs. So for instance, if you want to integrate with Azure, well, a lot of the stuff that's done on Azure is only made available for .NET Core in terms of opening, uh, in terms of providing a nice SDK and API surface. Now, you could probably do low level REST calls for a lot of stuff, but to really productively work on stuff, it's nice to have all the modern stuff. And with this, you can use it, right? So that's, that's very interesting. If you want to add, let's say machine learning as an example to your old WinForms app, you don't have to abandon your WinForms app and rewrite just to get those new features, but you can add them in. So that's really important. Now, does that mean this app is just going to run on Linux and it's going to run on the Mac? No, it doesn't, because this app is still a WinForms app. It relies on many Windows technologies that are there under the hood, like system.drawing and, and that sort of stuff. And therefore, it can't just run on Linux or the Mac. Now, would it be nice to have a Windows platform that runs on a Win on Linux and the Mac and mobile devices as well. Yes, it absolutely would. That's what the Samarin guys are doing with Maui. And we'll see how that turns out over the next year or so. Uh, but this is still a Windows app, but it's getting all the benefits that this platform provides. Now, moving along here, I actually switch over to an app that I created ahead of time. So in this case, for instance, I created I went a little further with this example and I created a WinForms app uh, that has a few controls on it. So I, I dropped a few buttons on it and then I dropped uh, this new thing on here. And this is actually a very interesting thing that we've gotten now with this .NET 5 generation of software. And that is the WebView 2 control. Now that is something that comes along as a NuGet package. Okay, so you can go to NuGet and you can load this. I already did that. I added it to my packages here. 
Uh, so it just says uh, microsoft.web.webview2. It just comes in as a package. And even though I'm in Windows Forms, that is now supported really nicely. So as I go into my toolbox, for instance, uh, I could now search for my WebView 2 control and here it is. So just because I added it as a NuGet package, it now shows up in my toolbox. And, and so that shows how we now have this experience that's real nicely integrated that didn't as such work before, right? So, so that's a cool thing. And, and what does this do exactly? Well, this is a web browser control. <clears throat> Excuse me. It allows me to embed HTML type content in my application. Now in the past, I had two options for that. I could host the old web view control, which was essentially Internet Explorer hosted inside of a Windows app. Well, how excited were any of us about hosting Internet Explorer inside of a Windows app? Not very, right? Because Internet Explorer had issues, as we know. The other alternative would be to host Chromium, but that was never as smooth as it was supposed to be. You were restricted in your compiler targets. Uh, and it was a huge install and so on. Now what this is, this is an edge-based control. So this is Edge Chromium, an evergreen browser, the, the, the same tech that Google's Chrome is based on and, and that Microsoft's new Edge browser is based on. And so it gives me a modern web browser control inside of my application. So when I compile this and run this, here is my form. And I can click on this button and all this button does is it sets the source property on this web view control. And as you can see, this now browses in this case to our website and I can move around here and, and I can see stuff in here. And you'll notice that everything just works. The CSS styling works, relatively fancy JavaScript works. Everything that Chromium can do and therefore Chrome and Edge and all the other Chromium browsers and then very similar to WebKit and Safari, right? Bottom line is it's a modern browser that now works inside of your WinForms application. And this, by the way, works all the way back to Windows 7. So just because we're using Edge doesn't mean it has to be Windows 10 works back to Windows 7. So that is very cool in my mind. I, I really like that. Um, another thing that I want to take a look at here real quick is I added another button here and it's just launching another example uh, form and here is this form and this is a relatively simple and straightforward form it has as you see two text boxes and an update button and we can look at the actual code here okay, double click into this um, and what we see here is I'm instantiating this form and, and in the constructor of this form, I'm creating this user object and I'm setting first name, last name and a created date. And I'm then assigning uh, the first name and last name to those text boxes. Nothing fancy going on here, right? But the, the thing that's interesting here is this user is not a class. What this guy is, is a record. Now this as such doesn't have anything to do with WinForms or WPF or anything like that. But what's interesting is that we can now use new features like C Sharp 9 records. Now what are C Sharp 9 records you ask? Well, they are this new feature that the C Sharp team added that's available on the .NET 5 platform and beyond. And it's something that really helps you with asynchronous coding. In other words, this is a special kind of class that you can now use that is immutable and therefore works really well with multi-threading and asynchronous execution. And so this is something that I used here and I'm, I'm, I'm integrating it with Windows Forms and when somebody clicks on the button and I want the values back out of those text boxes, I read it back out but I'm using this new with keyword and then I'm just displaying that information. And the reason I'm showing you all this is not that it has anything as such to do with Windows Forms, but I thought this was a very interesting example of a new feature in C Sharp that is super useful for modern development. And that's a feature that somebody else may use and you may then get a component that you want to call inside of your app and it needs to understand that. And you now can, right? So this is an example that I put together because I wanted you to see that moving to the .NET 5 platform gives you access to all this new stuff, okay? 
So I think that's very, very interesting and, uh, and, and definitely worth mentioning as well. Few other things here to mention really quick. Um, one is, I'm not gonna show a sample for this, but it's click once deployment. So if you're building a WPF app or building a WinForms app, or you have done that in the past, then most likely you will deploy it or, or relatively likely through click once because that's just a good way to do deployment and auto updates in a, in a very controlled and rich fashion uh, for Windows desktop apps. And click once didn't work before uh, in .NET 3.1. And it's now fully supported and works really nicely and just essentially does what you think it should do. Uh, another thing that's more interesting or that's also very interesting, but that I'm actually gonna dig into is single file deployment. What does that mean? Well, one of the things with .NET Core apps that was always problematic was that there were these awesome new apps that worked really well in, in cloud environments that scaled well, that could do side by side. We got away from this problem of which version of the framework is installed on the machine because <clears throat> it was just all very self-contained and you could have different versions side by side on the same box or in a, in a container or whatever. And that was all awesome. But when you had a simple scenario, like I want to build a single EXE and I then want to deploy that EXE, just X copy deploy it on a thumb drive, then it became really difficult because you had all these things that needed to be included because it wasn't part of Windows anymore. The full .NET framework is part of Windows, but you're kind of stuck with what you have on that box. With .NET Core and now .NET 5, you're independent of what's on the box, but it's your problem now to put the right things on the box, right? And so single file deployment fixes that. So what you can do with this, going back into code here, is when you look at your uh, project file, you could add a few more attributes. Like you could say, publish this as a single file is true. Uh, when you do that, it has to be prepackaged properly for a specific environment. In this case, uh, it's a Windows app, so WinX64 is what I chose. So that's my default that I'm creating. Now, I could target multiple things if I had, say, an ASP.NET web project or an API. I could still create a single file app and deploy it as that to a web server. But then maybe I have different targets. I want to support Linux as well as uh, Windows and, and other things. So I could put that in there. Um, then I can set a few additional things. Like I can say, publish this in a trimmed form. Now, that's really interesting. What this does is... It goes through everything I've done in my app and it looks at the things I use and it only brings in the, thing I use, the things I use, but not on a package level. It actually does so on a type level. So it performs what we call a tree shaking operation and it basically shakes off all the types and, and all the things you never use and then tries to package that all up in a single file. Okay? And then there's a, a further optimization you can do publish ready to run uh, does some things ahead of time that will make it launch faster, but make it a little larger so you can kind of do a trade-off there. So that's really interesting because now we can build this app and we can then right-click publish or um, automate it in some way in our DevOps pipeline. And then it creates essentially a single file out of that. Now it's not always a single file, uh, but it is very, very close to a single file. And it depends a little bit on the type of project you're building. Like it works really well for web projects. Uh, it creates several files for a Windows app right now. Uh, and especially for WPF apps, it even has a little bit of problems with tree shaking and sometimes trims too much and you may have to do some manual fiddling with that. So that's in a way still a work in progress and, and I'm sure that'll be improved and optimized going forward several years. Uh, but it's already working pretty darn well and it's a super useful feature. And at the end of the day, I don't care if I have one EXE that has it all in it when I'm creating a WinForms app or if I have 10 or, or six files in a folder, not that big a deal. Uh, but this feature is super, super useful. Um... Will the new web view control work with the .NET framework? And the answer to that is yes, it should. Um, will .NET 5 be automatically installed onto Windows 10 as a normal part of Windows updates? 
Uh, no, it won't. The idea with it is that you can deploy yourself. Now you can still do a framework dependent deploy where you kind of assume it's there because it's installed for some other reason, but it's not part of Windows the way uh, the full .NET framework was. And that's kind of the whole point of these new .NET versions is that you can kind of boil them down to something small and you deploy only what you need rather than this monstrosity and then maybe have 10 versions of that on a machine. Um, how big is a single hello world file? Uh, I don't know, I'd have to look it up. It's not that small, truth be told, because you're, you're getting base class libraries and stuff with it. Um, but I, I'd have to look up what the exact file size is. Uh, would you ever have published trimmed as false? Uh, yes, because sometimes when you do dynamic things, you may end up using certain things that the system cannot know ahead of time, right? So if you're, just, especially if you're building, say, a SAML-based app, you may use reflection or something to instantiate something that is based on a string that got created at runtime and the compiler ahead of time couldn't know that and you don't want that trimmed out. Okay, now I've already seen this as a question further up, but I knew I was uh, gonna get to my slide here. What does it take to convert full projects, full framework project, classic framework projects to .NET 5? And the answer to that is in many cases, not very much. And there now is actually a tool that helps you do that called the try convert tool, which doesn't ship out of the box with Visual Studio, but you can get it at this GitHub hub URL that I have on the screen here. Uh, and this is one of those .NET tools that you can install as a global tool. You can just uh, issue this command that it installs it. And then you can use a project and I'm gonna go and I'm gonna open one here that I created ahead of time. And I called it my old style app. And this is a, a super simple app with just a single form and it has some get file and get folder dialogues. And you'll see this is compiled to uh, .NET Framework 4. So Pretending this is a really old app. I made it earlier this week, but you get the idea. And when I run this app, uh, it just does some, some very simple things. Uh, so it has a get file dialog and I can go and I can pick a file from my hard drive somewhere and it puts it into the text box here. And then I can also do the same with get folder and it brings up this get folder dialog and, and you've probably seen this dialog before. And it's this horrible dialog that nobody really likes. Um, but but it works, right? That's what WinForms does. And and there you have it. So this is my WinForms app, WinForms C Sharp. Uh, we can't really dig into this project file easily. I'd have to unload it. And, and it's this monstrosity of a project file that's based on MS Build. And that's just the way .NET 4 full framework apps uh, used to work. Right now I can now go into my uh, command line here and I installed this try convert tool and I see we see here what's in this folder right now and I can just go ahead and I can say try convert and then I can say uh, dash W which uh, tells it uh, I'm looking for a solution file which is actually a folder deeper whoops So dash W and now we'll say old style app three dot solution. And this now goes and it tries to convert this app and it'll, it'll tell us whether this conversion worked or not. It'll give you warnings. There is some details that could be different, but by and large, these things should work relatively well. Okay. So it does this conversion now over here tells us, hey, something changed. Uh, do you want me to reload this? And yes, indeed, I want to reload that. And this has now created out of our old project, a new .NET 5 project or a converted .NET 5 project. Now you see the designer still works. The code is all the same, but I can now actually double click my project file here and see what's in the project file. And you see that it's targeting .NET 5 windows. Um, and we can now go ahead and we can run this. And now it runs on the .NET 5 platform once it compiles. Um, and it'll largely be the same app as before. Here it is. So I can go in here, do a get file dialog and grab one of these guys and I can do a get folder dialog. But notice 
that the get folder dialog now has changed. We're now immediately gaining an advantage by using the latest version of the framework, right? So I'm gonna say that and it works the same, but it's using newer components, but it's compatible, right? And that's what you should expect a lot of times when you're using the new framework. Now, is there some little incompatibilities, some SDKs that changed a little? Yes, there's some, but it's not like going from VB6 to VB.net, right? It's still the same overall environment. And in general, moving should not be that painful. Now with third-party components, can get a little trickier and, and just try it. Copy of your project to another folder, use the try convert tool and see uh, what happens with that. Um, .NET remoting, remoting isn't supported. So it's two very similar questions online, .NET remoting and WCF. And those are things that are currently not supported. I don't see remoting being brought forward. I would really try to replace that with something else. And WCF as such is also not really brought forward. Uh, there's some things on the client side that work, but there is an open source community project around that. So that's promising, right? To get some WCF things into the platform. And, and so that might still work, but it's a little bit up to the community at this point. So those are two examples. Uh, you're not gonna host at this point a WCF service on .NET Core, but you might be able to call it. So that's it for converting full framework projects. We talked about single file apps. I'm gonna switch over this. I don't have a demo for this, but I wanted to mention this. There's several different efforts going on right now around building desktop applications, because I guess web apps are super important. Nobody is gonna take anything away from that. It's still the biggest area in .NET 5. Uh, but it's clear that people still want to do desktop development. And we've actually seen quite a bit of WPF and WinForms development lately. And this is yet another effort that's going on. This is actually not coming from the .NET team, but this is coming from the Windows team. And what the Windows team is doing is they are building these components that are also known as Fluid UI. And they were formerly uh, the store apps and so on. But out of that grew all this tech that is a set of really highly polished Windows components. They were available in the 3.1 timeframe, uh, .NET Core 3.1 that is, uh, as SAML islands. And they are now available, they're called WinUI 3, and they are available as a preview currently because it's the Windows team, right? It's not totally in sync with the .NET team. Uh, and this is what allows you to add really nice components to your, to your app. So you could do either a WinUI app that's kind of like uh, the, the, the old Windows Universal apps, a new version of that, or you could use these components in your WPF or WinForms applications. And, and so again, it's nice to be able to bring WPF and WinForms forward. And I haven't shown you any WPF examples, but rest assured they, they get the same benefits as the WinForms ones. Uh, so you can use all these cool, highly polished new UI components inside of those applications. However, these are Windows 10 specific. So you need to have Windows 10 or later. Now Windows 10 has been around a while. That's probably not as big a deal anymore as it used to be, but it's still an issue for, for enterprise apps where you still have to support say Windows 7, for instance. Uh, so that's probably gonna be a topic in the future. Things like the, the Samarin guys with the Maui stuff they're building, they are using a lot of that taking great advantage of this. And, and so it surfaces in a lot of ways and we'll certainly be looping around to that again in the future. And finally, something that you probably haven't heard anything about in a long time and nobody really talks about that much, which is why I wanna make sure that I mention it in here, but we have Visual Basic support in .NET 5. Now you may say, well, who still does Visual Basic and it's everything that is C Sharp now? Well, that's not true. There's a lot of people that use Visual Basic and it's tremendously important, I feel, that we are not abandoning those people and they're dead-ended in, in the full framework and cannot move their assets forward. So with this, you can now build Visual Basic applications on top of .NET 5. Typically, that would be WinForms or WPF apps, I guess. Um, and the designers work, the language works. Now to be clear, the language is not gonna be enhanced. Uh, there's not gonna be a record type in Visual Basic in the future. 
but everything that was there worked. And of course, you can use the new APIs and integrate with all of that. Then, and maybe even gradually move to C Sharp because that is where most of the action is happening these days. But this means you can now take your VB.NET app, bring it forward using the try convert tool, and it should just work out of the box and uh, same characteristics as a C Sharp conversion. And now you can move forward with your Visual Basic desktop application into the new world. So, so that's in a way unexciting to a lot of people. But if you need this, and we have a lot of customers that do, uh, in fact, we have some uh, old Visual Basic apps ourselves in our own infrastructure that we are running. And it's tremendously important that we can now move that forward and then gradually move on. And that's a big theme these days. We should really have moved past this idea of you throw out your whole system and you rebuild and, and we'll see you again in two years. Uh, that should not happen if you've started building a system in the 2000s, right? If you're using VB6, okay, that was that big step. But since then, it should be much more gradual and I'd, I'd expect um, that uh, you should be able to do that. Uh, some questions. Windows services, I believe there's no templates for that at this point, but I'd have to look that up. And SSRS, I believe works, but I'm not an SSRS expert, but ping us, ping me afterwards. Uh, because we do have some people in the company that are SSRS experts and I can get you that answer. Is there a straightforward way to, to migrate a pure Windows app to the Mac uh, with .NET 5? Well, if it's a WinForm, let, let's say you have a Visual Basic uh, .NET WinForms app, then there's no real easy way to just make that run on the Mac. Now, the answer to how do you build an app that runs on the Mac, if you don't want to build a web app, I'm assuming, uh, then it will be Samarin at this point. It will be Samarin in the future, which uh, is going to be that Maui project that's going to be beyond Samarin. But whether that will just convert from VB.net or even a C Sharp WinForms app, I think is... Well, it's unknown at this point, but I would be super surprised. Let's put it like that. I think the characteristic is probably going to be more like converting WinForms to WPF. Uh, you know, it's not the same thing, but just mindset wise, it might be somewhat similar. And so we are doing stuff where we help with the uh, uh, automatic conversion. We have some tools that, that are custom that we use in our projects that are usually customized for each project where we bring things forward and we help preserve these assets. You have the code that still runs. So if you have proper architecture in your older apps, that, that's still very helpful. Often we have to extract that out. Uh, so there's things we can do, but it's not just going to be recompile my WinForms or WPF app to run on the Mac or Linux. Uh, and uh, one final note before we move past the desktop uh, topic, you can absolutely develop your WinForms and WPF projects using Visual Studio Code. However, be aware that that's only the code part. Uh, you're not doing any designers or graphical drag and drop in VS Code because VS Code is only about code. So you're doing low level development with code. I still do that quite a bit on WinForms and WPF apps because the coding experience is just so much faster and so much more lightweight. So I often put together my UIs and when it comes to heavy coding, I switch into VS Code and then maybe I'll go back to the other one. Uh, but you can absolutely uh, run your applications out of VS Code. You can debug your applications. All of that does work. And again, I, I'm aware that we have a lot of questions online that I haven't answered yet. And, uh, I know some people probably feel I skipped over them, but I will uh, get back to that afterwards and, and I'll answer all your questions. Now let's talk a little bit about web development. Let's switch gears here because we talked a lot about desktop development already and and I, I like that we did that because nobody else does that and there's so many people out there that still have those Windows applications and there's a lot of people that, that want desktop apps for various reasons that are absolutely valid and we kind of see that more. So that's one of the things I want to relay is if you feel like, oh my God, I I have, you know, I'm almost ashamed that I still have a Windows desktop app and we should all be on the web and I'm the only one who doesn't. You're not the only one. Uh, we actually see more and more people that actually want real Windows applications again and, and have very specific reasons for that. So don't feel bad about it. Nevertheless, web development, of course, is 
the bigger part of .NET development that's going on. And the most interesting area, the hottest area that is currently going on in web development is Blazor. Blazor in itself is a huge topic. What is Blazor in a nutshell? Blazor is a new web development framework uh, that has some real unique advantages because the next question you're going to ask is, well, why do we need yet another web development framework? Well, Blazor is a component-based framework that can run both server-side and client-side. Uh, the client side being the real fancy one, because what Blazor does is it allows you to create C sharp code, .NET code, reuse code you already have, because we're talking .NET 5 now. So all the .NET 5 code you have, so say some business component or some, some logical calculation, um, you can just use in Blazor, right? So you can reuse your code and Blazor can actually run in the browser, now you're going to say, well, how does it do that? Does it compile to JavaScript? No, it doesn't. It compiles to something known as WebAssembly. WebAssembly is a binary standard that's supported by all modern browsers. And WebAssembly allows you to basically use any compiler to compile to this WebAssembly assembly binary standard. It's very, very close to assembly language, but not quite because it's still cross-platform. But, but as close to that as you get without being platform-specific. And that's supported in all browsers and therefore we now have the runtime running on that and therefore we can load .NET DLLs and, and .NET code and, and execute it. And Microsoft built the whole framework around that uh, and that's called Blazor. And so in a Blazor app on the client, you're building components, you have a very nice HTML type of syntax using Razor pages essentially. And inside those Razor pages, you can write C sharp code or you can write JavaScript code. You can integrate with CSS, HTML, that it still uses that for the UI, but the code is done, uh, or at least can be done in .NET and it integrates well with JavaScript as well. So that in a nutshell is Blazor on the client, also known as Blazor WebAssembly. And then on the server side, we have something that's syntax compatible, but it can run on the server, but uses the same model, which is the nice framework, the component-based framework around it. Uh, so that's Blazor, and we have a whole stata.net that just focuses just on Blazor, very popular uh, stata.net that I did, and it's available for free uh, to watch on stata.net.com. Uh, so what's new in Blazor? Well, it came out with .NET 3.1, .NET Core 3.1. That was the first released Blazor version. Uh, but now we move to .NET 5. And with .NET 5, we move to this shared platform because in the past, Blazor used to run on a mono runtime inside of WebAssembly. So now it's all shared, which means greater compatibility. There's also significant performance improvements. Uh, the way this WebAssembly runtime works, uh, it's pretty fast, but it's not as fast as native. Uh, but they've now gotten a lot closer again with this latest uh, version. Now there's a few specific features that I can't all get into. Things like pre-rendering for performance is very nice. Virtualization support, I'm actually going to show you uh, a little bit of an example about. So, so let's go back into Visual Studio here. And my big sample app here has a Blazor app. We'll make that the startup project and collapse everything else. And so what we have here is you can already kind of tell by the structure of this project that we have a web application. Uh, you can even combine this with, with the typical ASP.NET server side stuff. But what's kind of interesting is we have our different pages in here. So for instance, we have a page that's a counter. And if you've done anything with Razor before, Razor syntax, so ASP.NET MVC, style stuff, then you know the syntax fundamentally, right? So we have essentially HTML code interlaced with C-sharp snippets. And this is, by the way, C-sharp only, there's no VB here, right? But so we have that, and then we have extensions to that. So for instance, here we have a button, and we have the add on click event. Now that's an extension Microsoft provides us to say, hey, once, when somebody clicks this, call uh, an increment count method. And note that the increment count method is written down here as C sharp. The C sharp is going to compile into a .NET DLL, which is then going to run uh, inside of WebAssembly, inside a browser. And that could be any browser. It could be iOS, it could be Android, because it's supported everywhere. 
Okay, so this just increments this current count field and that current count field is the one that's bound up here. Uh, another example that I did here, um, just to have a quick example, is I created a employee class with a few fields and I'm binding that up here but using a for each to create a table, right? So this gives you an example of how do you do data in Blazor. I, I, I can't get into deep data, uh, Blazor examples, but this is just to give you an idea, right? So we are for eaching this, and this actually starts out as an empty list of employees. Um, and then down here, I have some code that's linked to a button, and when I click that, it creates more employees. And so let's fire this up. We'll run this. Build succeeded, it says. Here comes the browser. And we'll see our client side app load here in a moment. Now the loading, by the way, is one of those uh, things that was a little slow in the past with Blazor and you saw it right here. If I hit refresh, it's, it's fast, right? But it could be faster. And there's actually things that you can do. You can now do lazy loading and a few other things. But anyway, here is that counter and I can click that and note how that counter counts up here. Uh, and here's my generate employees button and when I do that it generates 10 employees and I can do that again and it just it just binds it down like this, okay? Now somebody online is asking how long is the session? Probably another 10 minutes or so and then uh, my, my guys are gonna tell me I shouldn't do this much longer. <laughs> um, now one of the performance improvements that we have in Blazor is when we deal with a lot of data. So let's say I'm creating 100,000 employees every time I click that button. If I do that, you would notice that the display takes probably, you know, noticeably probably 10 seconds to refresh. But I actually have a different syntax that I can now use here. So instead of doing a for each loop, Microsoft now introduced this optional virtualize component and I'm gonna take the for each out and this will then automatically perform virtualization for me. So it's almost syntax compatible except instead of for each I'm doing virtualize and I'm telling it what items to use and how many at a time it should do and we'll let that run again. And what happens now when I click the button is the button is going to create 100,000 employee records behind the scenes, but that's a lot of data for the UI to swallow. But you see that it pretty much happened immediately. But when I now scroll down smoothly behind the scenes, Blazor is going to generate the required UI to actually show this rather than doing it all at once the way HTML would normally do it. And, and so this is a dramatic performance improvement that we have in Blazor. So those are just some examples here. Uh, can Blazor be debugged through the web browser tools is a question online. The answer is yes. You can actually debug it inside of the Chromium or, or any browser tools. Uh, you can also debug it inside of Visual Studio if you want. So it depends on your configuration. And that's actually one of the things that also got improved greatly with Blazor and .NET 5. Uh, so that's one of the things that if you watch my Blazor stata.net, I actually had a little bit of a problem with the config while I did my stata.net and that's because switching between different configs was a pain and error prone and that has all been improved greatly so debugging works a whole lot better at this point. So there's a few other things that we could talk about here. There's the ability to pre-render components for better performance on initial load, also for search engine optimization. Um, there's lazy loading of assemblies. So if you have a very large Blazor app and you just want to go into a small part of the app, there's no need to load the whole thing and they're doing a much better job at lazy loading at this point. So overall performance improvements, which was probably the biggest point of criticism for Blazor in 3.1. And then there's one feature here that's actually really cool that's called CSS isolation. CSS isolation means when you create a component like this, um, this counter thing here, is actually a component that you can use somewhere else. So where was that? Well, that gets loaded directly, but 
Here's another example. So this that's just the survey component in here and you can then use it using this syntax. So that is actually probably under shared is the survey and and up here you can use it like like that. Well, if that survey component creates CSS to style its HTML, that could potentially throw off other HTML because if that component has something for an H1 tag to be styled differently, that would throw off your whole app. Well, no more in uh, Blazor 5, in .NET 5, because we now have the ability to do CSS isolation. So you can create CSS that only applies to your components, so kind of a cool approach to doing it. I also want to draw your attention, not just to the state of .NET we did, uh, go watch that as well, but at .NET Conf, our very own uh, Dr. Otto Dobritzberger did a whole presentation uh, on Blazor as well and comparing client and server side Blazor, which is very, very interesting. So go ahead and watch that as well. Here's the YouTube link. You can find it relatively easy, but again, you can also download this slide deck with the link in it and we'll send you some follow-up information on that. All right, well, that's my really brief dip into web development. There's so much more to talk about, but I had to pick and choose what I can actually uh, go over. The final thing I want to go into, and we're already starting to run kind of low on time, but here's my final uh, area that I want to touch on, and that is API development. API development has always worked really well in .NET and .NET Core for, the, for that matter, but Microsoft improved the overall experience. So it's not so much that there was functionality that was lacking, but there certainly is a, a nice uh, approach to improving the overall uh, productivity when you build APIs. And I created a quick and simple example around that as well, uh, which was this one. So here I have a a simple ASP.NET web API type of project, just creating it uh, using the standard template for that. And when you create the standard template, it creates this weather forecast service as an example for you, right? So it says, hey, here's this controller. This controller returns some data and, and you can then call this, like here is a, a get method that allows you to call a weather forecast and it just has some fake data. And the idea would be you then go and you probably rip out the weather forecast and you create your own API that you need to create. Um, so what's nice about the, the latest version is that in the startup project, it configures a few new things. First of all, it configures Swagger Gen. Swagger Gen uh, creates what's now known as uh, Open API. Open API Swagger are interchangeable terms pretty much in that sense. And what it does is this is a way to document your API. So this creates a so-called Swagger file, which then tells people what's in your, your REST-based API. So it's essentially documentation, or, or if you want to think of it like that, a contract for your uh, web API or, or API services. And then also by default, if the app is launched in development mode, but only then, but you could change that if you wanted. It also uses Swagger UI and Swagger UI essentially creates a test bench for you. So let's just see if we can fire this up. That should be fine. Let's see what it does. Doesn't want to cooperate. Let's see if you can use Kestrel for it. So this compiles the app. It then enables everything that's in that app. And here it's launching. And now here comes our browser. And because Swagger is now enabled, we see a nice interface that's only available by default during debug. Um, but now we see exactly what's in this. So for instance, it says, oh, there's this weather forecast and it's a get operation. Let's drill into that and see what that is. Oh, I can try it out right here. That's nice. And I can now go ahead and I can actually execute this method and see what's coming back. And here is my result from that particular service. So I have this swagger based standardized UI around this. Now, of course, I could do everything else I'm used to. I could uh, put a, a breakpoint in here if I wanted and all that. I'm not going to go into that. 
but really, really nice that we can now do that and have a simple way to run these services and see what's going on. And it can be a more complex one, like I created another one here that's actually using a post. So when you do a post, uh, we actually have to post some JSON to it, something similar to this, and I can say execute. And uh, what this does is it's actually gonna launch somewhere my Visual Studio Code. Well, I already had the information cache, but if I did this the first time, it would launch a default editor that's configured so I can change the JSON that gets posted. And, and so long story short, this is actually a pretty cool thing, pretty cool addition during development time that allows me to test my services and, and also document my services for documentation. Uh, this is really good. So, so that's very cool to have. And then there's one other thing that I want to draw your attention to, and that's this HTTP REPL tool that we have. Uh, so that's also something that's new that you can install as an optional .NET tool. Uh, when you have that tool, you can just go into the command line. You can run your API-based project that creates a Swagger file, and you can then point HTTP REPL at that Swagger file and start interacting with it. Or what's even nicer is you can go in here and you can use this select web browsers oops not select web browsers it's the uh, where am i at it's not this <laughs> browse with there we go no there's my dialogue. Okay, so what you can do in here is you can define different ways of launching your app. And note what I did in here is I added HTTP REPL uh, right in here to my ways of launching the app. And you can do this by saying add, uh, you then point it to the EXE that got installed. Uh, and by the way, this is a, there's a great article in the Code Focus magazine about that. Uh, so I did that and I just gave it a friendly name of HTTP REPL. So it's essentially pointing at this tool that I have here. And now when I go ahead and I actually launch my, my project using this thing. So I say go ahead and, and launch with HTTP REPL. If it is switching. It's not totally cooperating at the moment. There we go. Okay. It's not taking my setting. Let's try this one more time. Let's IS Express again. Yeah, that should be fine. Let's see if it does it or if it's giving us problems. Yeah. Always the last demo that fails. It's probably already compiled and running and not happy. There we go. Okay, so then this REPL tool starts up and notice we are now in a command line utility that looks like uh, a directory browser. And we can actually go in here and we can say dear and notice that it shows us our services that we have as if they were folder. And if you're a Linux guy, you could do LS, right? Both work. And so now we could do something like CD weather forecast and I can actually type WE and hit tab and it just does it. And then I can do there again. And so where are we at? Oh, we're in this weather forecast. We can do a get, well, we run a get and here it goes and, and it returns the data from our service. So this REPL tool is just kind of a cool tool if you're a command line guy where you can treat these services as if they were uh, folders almost, because in a way that's what REST-based services are. And right? if you think of, oh, my customer service that returns customer data, well, it's almost like going into a folder that has the customers in it and getting it, right? So uh, to a lot of people that makes a lot of sense and it's nice to have this just 
as yet another option available to us when running services. So, so I think that's kind of a cool tool that's a, a really nice uh, to have available as well. Okay, and that gets us through the demos. Again, there's so much more to say about .NET 5. I encourage you to go back, uh, watch my .NET 5 presentation from last month. Uh, and also go to .NET Conf, read Code Focus Magazine, uh, all free information that's available to you. And you should take advantage of that. A few other things that are of interest that I encourage you to check out, C Sharp 9, F Sharp 5, the two core languages of .NET 5. Lots and lots of new features in, in each of them. I kind of hinted at the records feature that's in there now. That's actually really cool, immutable classes. Very cool feature. So check that out. Another thing that's very important, Entity Framework 5. I encourage you to check that out as well. I haven't had a chance to really dig into that. Something to watch for the future is definitely Maui coming from the Samarin team. So watch for news. I'm sure we'll see news about that even before it uh, officially releases in .NET 6. And then, of course, we have all the Azure stuff. Again, we have a state of .NET about Azure. Uh, and we have new tooling support and various things, of course, as you would expect in Visual Studio, in .NET 5. Everything revolves around Azure these days. And even if you're building a desktop app, most likely you're building it with something coming from Azure with it so, or some other cloud for that matter. So that brings us to the end of the core presentation. A few other announcements. Quick reminder, uh, if you could take the survey, <clears throat> that would really help us out. In particular, what I'm interested in is things that you want to hear about. Like we already uh, tailored some of these events, uh, the topics of these events, to what people want to hear. And so that's very nice. And, and we, we're planning more events. Uh, it's going to be a continuous thing. So let us know what you want to hear and, and I could really use your help with that. So thank you very much in advance for that. Um, another thing, a lot of people always sit there and say, hmm, I wonder how all of this applies to my project. I don't have to abandon my vp.net winforms app. That's great, but what do I do with my project, right? Or I want to go into Blazor, but for my specific scenario, is it the right thing? And so what we are offering is a free hour of consulting that more and more people are taking advantage of. Uh, no strings attached. You don't have to send us a credit card or anything like that. It's just, if you came to this event, you want more information, if it takes an hour, that's great. If it takes a half an hour, if it takes an hour and a half, fine, right? We're not the kind of company that'll send you an immediate invoice just because it went five minutes over. And, and that's been very interesting also to see what people are doing with this tech and how they use it. Uh, and in, in some ways, that's also what I pass on to you, right? Like, what are people interested in? Are people still doing WinForms development? Well, as we discovered, yes, people are. And so I encourage you to take advantage of that. Uh, contact Jim uh, or at the info at codemac.com uh, email address and we'd be happy to give you more information. Finally, you know, read Code Magazine. Uh, it's a labor of love for me. It's a, a site business, but it's a really cool site business. I love doing it. Got a new mobile app. Uh, we got, made all our content for free on the mobile app during the Corona crisis. Uh, so you can read Code Magazine for free all the way back to when we started uh, through this mobile app. Um, so check that out as well. If you're a Microsoft customer, VSS, former MSDN, uh, or just Dev Essentials, which is their free stuff, you can now go into their system. You're already gonna get a Code Magazine subscription, but let your friends know if they have any of this stuff, they can go into it and they get a copy courtesy of Microsoft. We have a partnership with them where they essentially make it available to their customers. And then uh, next, Stata.net, uh, we already have it on our calendars. It's going to be December 16th. Uh, it would normally be the 23rd, uh, but that's too late in the year because of Christmas, so we're doing it the 16th. We are still uh, debating what the topic is, so send us some feedback on that. An early favorite uh, seems to be an overview of current DevOps and what's available there. But let us know what you're interested in uh, and then we'll, we'll announce that topic relatively shortly. So, so don't delay too long. And that's it. Thank you very much for attending. I hope you got some, some benefit out of this. Contact us if you have further questions. Consider us a resource. I'm more than happy 
uh, to answer questions. Also, my guys have already answered a lot online. I'll now be sticking around a little longer, just going through the, the questions that have remained unanswered. Uh, but other than that, thank you very much for attending and, and we'll call it a day. Uh, and thank you and see you next time. Uh, so just take a quick look at it here. Uh, nullable reference types taken into account when generating Swagger docs. Yes, they should be working fine. Uh, will you have desktop client server applications that need to integrate with MapPoint? I want to migrate to a web-based application with Azure. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you should be able to still integrate with MapPoint uh, if you have a web-based app on .NET 5 because that integration should not change. I think the WCF question we already answered, what's the future of WCF? Uh, it's kind of being replaced with two technologies. One is, of course, REST, and the other is gRPC, another technology that I would love to have spent time on in the talk today. Uh, but that's kind of a binary replacement that's still based on HTTP. Uh, so that's really where the future is. It's WCF v next, if you want to think of it like that. But if you do actually have WCF, uh, the hosting of WCF services will probably remain uh, in the full framework, right? So you can still do that. It's not going to stop working. It's going to be supported forever because full framework is part of Windows. Uh, but don't expect to move that into uh, .NET 5 anytime soon. Now the calling side of it, uh, there's some support for that, uh, but not the server side. And there's a community effort, like I said, around WCF. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, what procedures do I follow when I incorporate WinUI in my desktop apps? Um, well, I don't, uh, I guess, how does it work? Uh, well, there's the SAML Islands technology that allows you to basically create a host container in which these uh, components run and it works better than the old days. So uh, if you're familiar with the airspace issues that we had there, uh, that's somewhat better. It's not perfect to, to be honest, but it's somewhat better. And then you still have some issues. Like, for instance, uh, a WinUI app can do amazing things with transformations like scaling and rotating. And, uh, it's just a very modern environment. And that often sticks out like a sore thumb when you then have an old style WinForms app that, that has trouble even zooming in on the UI and things like that. So, so you're not going to get that automatically, but it's still a benefit that provides awesome things like the web view control. And so you kind of saw... A little bit of a glimpse of that, how I embedded the web view. It's really kind of automatic, but it puts a host container inside of it. Will the new web view control work with .NET Framework? I think I answered that. Uh, yes, that should be the answer for that. Uh, we have a WinForms WPF app that consumes WCF services. So we'd have to see exactly, and I'd be happy to explore that with you, uh, how you consume services, because there's so many things WCF can do. Uh, to see whether that can work in .NET 5. So, that, so I will have to, the sort of consultant's answer, right? It depends, but I'd be happy to look at that. Uh, I think we answered how to convert from .NET Framework to .NET 5. Can you develop applications in .NET 5 that run in all the frameworks? Uh, if you target .NET 5, then no, you're targeting .NET 5. But I think the question is more, can you use the latest version of Visual Studio to target all the frameworks? Yes, you can. And in fact, if you're targeting .NET Standard 2, that's the last version that the full framework, the old .NET framework also supports. And so you can use some of the new stuff in that and the old framework will support that, but not if you're doing anything newer. And so if you're building something that works perfectly fine in .NET Standard 2, there's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to force yourself to be in .NET 5 if you need that broader reach for it. Uh, so, so you can do it in that sense. Um, what about automatic testing and uh, robotic process automation? Is there anything new? Um, I'm not f the guy to talk to about uh, RPA, to tell you the truth. So. I, I'm sure there's a ton of new stuff going on. Uh, there's some things that I'm a little bit knowledgeable about, like Project Mojave, that are, that are really cool and I encourage you to look into that, but I can't knowledgeably uh, speak to anything beyond that. So if you want to take that offline, uh, send me an email. I can get you the answers on that, but I personally am not, uh, not the guy. Um, 
It's a question. Somebody says we've built uh, old style .NET Framework apps which run well on thousands of machines running the .NET Framework 4.5 and later Windows 7 and Windows 10. How long will these continue to work? They will continue to work just fine. That framework version ships with Windows, which means every time Microsoft puts out a version of Windows, the support cycle resets. So it's not going to run a fallout. Of, it's not like a, you know, a Windows XP situation where it's like, oh my God, support runs out. Those applications will be supported for the foreseeable future. And if they run fine, let them run fine. There, there's no need to, to convert that. Now, if you have an easy conversion path because you use try convert and, and you know, there's not a lot that you'd have to change, then I would encourage you to look at that because you, know, you get some newer dialogues, as you saw in my example. You get access to newer APIs much more easily. You don't have to always dip to low-level HTTP REST calls. Uh, so all the new stuff, it's going to happen on top of that stuff. So if you can convert it easily, great. But if not, that stuff will continue working just fine. Okay, so so don't freak out over that. We, we're kind of on the Microsoft platform. We're kind of past this, you know, panicking you out of, oh my God, my old app is going to die. It, it's not. Um, somebody's asking about an, an app that they want to convert using WCF, WPF, Enterprise Library, among others. And we don't know how much is supported on .NET 5. I would expect a lot to be supported on that. WCF being a little bit iffy, uh, but again, you're probably not hosting anything. You're calling it in your desktop app. So it's something that we'd have to look at in detail. I'd be more than happy to sit down with you. You know, that hour of consulting offer stands uh, and looking at it more specifically to see uh, how compatible it is. But uh, I, I would expect some work, but I wouldn't expect it to be you know, a, a two-year project like it used to be in the past. And uh, same as a, another question, how much effort will it be? Uh, it depends uh, uh, how hard it is to convert the old WinForms app to the, to the core, but it's probably easier than you think, is, would be my answer. But I'd be happy to explore it with you in detail. Um, Somebody says, uh, created library projects with .NET Standard and then implementations with .NET Core. Does the .NET 5 approach change in any way? No, that's essentially the same because it's just the newer version of .NET Core in that sense, right? That may be simplified, but in that sense, it really should work just like that. So you should be in really good shape with the investment you have. And I think that's it with the unanswered questions. Uh, uh, oh, there's another one. Improvements to Signal R. Um, I'm not sure the core, whether core Signal R has received any improvements. It's more that Signal R is being used in various new ways. I'm sure that caused improvements. I'm not, I don't have a list of improvements, but for instance, the Blazor server-side stuff uses that to communicate with the client. And so it's, there's new stuff in that sense. But I think the core is very stable and works really well. So I think that was the last question. Um, and with that, we'll, we'll call it a day. But feel free to contact us if you have any more questions, like I said. I'd be more than happy uh, to answer that. So thank you very much. And see you next time. Thank you.